You're listening to the Love Over Addiction Podcast. Hey there, how are you doing? This is a little nuts, isn't it? I am in my closet again. We're on like day 30 something of this virus. And I'm wondering how you're hanging in there. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a weird podcast, but we're in weird times. So I feel like I can get away with it. I want to set the scene first, though. Okay. Today, it's actually in the evening. It's around 8 o'clock. Um, I'm tired. We've been doing a lot of home renovations during this virus situation. So for dinner, I just put out a charcuterie board and outside on the back deck of our home, called out the kids, told them to jump in the pool and come take bites of cheese and salami in between going in and out of the pool. And that was dinner. Like, that was a wrap. And charcuterie sounds really fancy. It's just my, it's nothing close to being fancy, at least mine aren't. If you have a gazillion kids like I do, it's basically whatever is left over in your fridge on a platter and then on like a board and then laying it out and calling it a charcuterie board. (laughs) So I had leftover cheese. I had leftover salami. You can get like prosciutto or whatever from like the grocery store, leftover veggies. Sometimes I put chocolate chips, anything like veggies, whatever. You can go on Pinterest and find charcuterie boards, but they're basically like a hack to dinner time. And then kids can like come and eat what they want whenever they want. So anyways, charcuterie board tonight, pool time, and I've got the radio playing. And I normally play it to like some concert. My kids love Coldplay. Here's where it gets weird. So we're listening to Coldplay concert live. And we've been out there for a couple hours. And I'm like, okay, I've got to go back to my um, painting project. So I leave the music on. I'm outside. I'm painting my outdoor. um, Is this too much detail? This might be too much detail. (laughs) You're like, get to the point, Michelle. I'm getting there. Actually, I'm not even close to getting there. So you might want to fast forward this. But I'm painting my doors and Chris Martin is singing that song, Fix You. I'm not even sure if that's the title. Um, And I was thinking about the last time I have heard that song or more actually the first time I heard that song. Now, if you're not familiar with that song, I highly suggest you go listen to it because it provides a lot of context for the podcast and kind of the lesson I'm teaching today. But it's basically, the theory is, is that Gwyneth Paltrow, who he was married to, who I'm mildly obsessed with, um, he wrote the song for her when her dad died. Now, I could be so wrong, but this is the story I've made up in my head about what went on in their relationship and what this song is about. If that's not true, please do not write. Do not ruin it for me. I have this sweet little moment between him and her. And the whole song is about him trying to fix her. She's crying. There's a tear down her cheek because her dad died. And he's like, she's brokenhearted. And he's watching her through this pain. And he's like, I'm going to fix you. And I remember the first time I heard that song. And it was years and years and years and years ago. Well, okay, that was maybe one too many years. It was years and years ago. I was sitting on my bed. It had just come out. I was playing it on my laptop. And my husband at the time, my first husband, one who suffers from addiction, was next to me, passed out on the bed. And I remember hearing this song. And you guys... We we know each other so well, you just cannot judge me for this because I am, I am aware and I'm intelligent enough woman to understand what I'm about to say is ridiculous. But I remember 
looking at my husband and going, why don't you love me the way Chris Martin loves Gwyneth Paltrow? Like, can't you fix me? I'm broken too. Now, my dad had not died, but I felt broken inside. Don't we all? Isn't that the reason why we entered these relationships in the first place? And I remember looking at him and being like, thinking, he's not the husband that I need him to be. And I would kill for a guy to notice my pain, notice my tears, be moved enough to write a song about it, and do everything he can to try and make me feel better. Essentially, I wanted to be loved the way that I felt like Chris Martin was loving his wife at the time. Ridiculous, like I said. But... But the essence of it is not ridiculous, which is um, a lot of us in relationships with addicts and alcoholics, we feel invisible and we don't feel cherished and we don't feel special because we constantly feel like they are choosing alcohol and drugs over us. They are choosing to not get better. They are choosing their illness or their disease or whatever you want to call it, whatever label you want to put on it, they're choosing that over our relationship, over our feelings, over our kids sometimes, over us. And that makes us feel worthless. And it makes us feel um, like we've done something wrong. Like we are not worthy of being loved or noticed. Or, or we are not worthy of being chosen. And so I remember thinking subconsciously, okay, I need this love that I hear other people experiencing that I do not understand, um, but I know I want and I need. So if he's not willing to do this for me, um, it must be my fault. And there must be something that I could do better that would make him want to fix me, that would make him want to love me, like the way that I imagine... um, other people love women. Other people love their wives. So fast forward, I'm painting this door tonight and remembering how desperate, like in my gut, in my soul, I was, it was like desperation was coming out of my pores to just be loved, to just be worth fighting for. And it probably goes back to me being a kid and feeling the same way with my dad. Um, that's another podcast. But, but the point is, is that it was a neediness, right? And I never got it. The truth be told, I did all the tricks in the book, all the manipulations, I worked on myself so hard. I worked on our marriage. I did everything I was supposed to do. And the bottom line, the simple truth is that he didn't choose me. He chose drinking and drugs. He didn't choose his kids. He chose his his addiction. And so I chose to leave. And we had a tragic ending to our love story, to our marriage. So fast forward again, to me painting the door. Sorry, I digress there for a second. And I'm remembering this and thinking, okay, I'm looking at my second husband, Brian, and he's out there in the backyard fixing the trampoline um, for the kids. And I'm looking at him and thinking, Michelle, you know, Brian cannot fix you because the truth that you found out about yourself during the process of leaving your first husband is that it's nobody's job to fix you. Nobody has that power. And if they do, that's a really scary thing because then they have the power to also break you. So the life lesson there is you got to fix yourself there's the empowerment, right? But the man that's putting together and fixing the trampoline while you paint the door would do anything to try and fix you. 
He would do walk to the ends of the earth. He would lay his life down. He would exhaust himself to try and fix you if you needed fixing. And that is the difference between my first marriage and my second marriage is the first one I was looking to be fixed. I came into the marriage a broken, wounded little girl who was giving away my power to the man who would come in and save her, the knight in shining armor, the guy who would say the right thing that would mend her heart, heal her up, and give her the confidence that she needed, only to be let down and disappointed over and over again, not only because he was addicted, but because I was looking in the wrong place to the wrong person. And when I became single and I left him, that whole time, the only person I could turn to was myself. And you know what? That's when it actually started working. That's when I started to feel better was when addiction wasn't taking my attention away all the time from my own personal growth and my children and my life. That it was no longer a distraction to try and get him sober. But then I was left there with this puddle of feelings about myself and my life and how did I get here that I needed to deal with. Once I started cleaning up the mess and addressing that, and I was going to therapy three times a day and I was reading everything I could get my hands on, um, once I started doing that, then I realized oh my gosh, everything I was looking for was right there the entire time. It was right there. It was all within me. It was all within my reach. I just used addiction as a distraction, as an an excuse to avoid dealing with my own crap, right? And avoiding, in a very loving way, um, avoiding falling in love with myself, which sounds so hokey and generic, but it's true. So that was a huge deal, Um, not relying on another man to tell me that I was good and figuring that out and claiming it as I was good. Um, I've always been good. I was just choosing the wrong people to... um, to reflect back to me what I truly believed about myself, which was that I am, you know, unlovable. So I got married a second time and now I can look at him and go, I can't, he can't fix me. He doesn't possess that power. But I love the fact that I fell in love with a man who would do anything to try. I love the fact that I have a man that is not so self-involved, that is not sick, that is healthy and giving. And my dad said um, the other day about Brian, he said he's one of the kindest man that he's ever known. And it's true. And let me tell you guys that are listening to this, I never tell you these stories to brag to you ever. If you hung out with me long enough in real life, you'd know that that's the last thing that I am as a bragger. I tell you these things to remind you that you are just like me and that you are deserving of somebody that would do anything to fix you. And also to remind you that no matter where you are in your relationship, leaving, staying, coming, going, undecided, whatever, that The only person that can fix you is you. And you've got everything you need to start. This podcast is created for your support, encouragement, and entertainment with Michelle's personal thoughts and beliefs. From one woman to another, bonded together by the fact we love someone suffering from addiction. This is not intended as a substitute for therapy or advice from a professional.